10. The Rogue, out rogued. Praiseworthy remained remarkably calm. He didn't so much as raise an eyebrow, but he did give Jack a faint poke in the ribs. Uh, sorry, a poke in the ribs with his elbow as if to say, Easy, Master Jack, easy. Leave the scoundrel to me. Smart world, ain't it? grinned Cut-Eye Higgins. His hand remained at rest in silent warning on the butt of his pistol. I hadn't noticed until today, said Praiseworthy. If I didn't know better, I'd think you were still in Rio. The villain's scarred eye was set at a squint. Rio was too hot for me, you might say. So I lit out for Panama, across the Isthmus, by bongo boat and mule back. A whole parade of folks is getting to the Pacific that way. And it looks like beat you to California at that. I dare say you had a good map to guide you. The man in the Jiffy Joppa hat bared his yellow teeth in a laugh. A map? A map? Why, what map is that? Praiseworthy narrowed his glance. I bring you regards from the good Dr. Buckby. Well, now, ain't that neighborly of you? The stage charged across the valley flats, and the French men shook handkerchiefs in front of their noses to keep the dust away. Jonas T. Fletcher kept shooting tobacco juice out of the window as if the ground were on fire. Jack's hand fell to the horn spoon in his belt. He could almost imagine it was a four-shooter that would make Mr. cut Higgins sit up and take notice why he'd beg to hand over Dr. Buckby's gold map. The dueling pistol in his belt would be no match for a four-shooter. But Praiseworthy didn't seem in the least concerned about the lack of firearms. Have you met Mr. Fletcher, he said, tugging at his left glove. He tells me he's an undertaker. A man in your line of work, sir, never knows when he'll need the services of a good undertaker. I didn't get the name, said the Missourian. Higgins, cut I grinned. Doc Higgins, dentist. Well now, smiled the undertaker. The boils will be glad to have a tooth extractor in the cap. Praiseworthy winked at Jack. The imposter had apparently given up his judgeship. A dentist, was he? specializing in extracting gold teeth, no doubt. And now, if, you'll ex if you gentlemen will excuse me, said the butler, I believe I'll catch a nap. Sleep, Jack thought. How could anyone sleep with Mr. Cutty Higgins sitting there? But before the stage had traveled another quarter of a mile, praiseworthy was napping soundly. Jack sat gazing at the villain, their knees almost touching, and the man in the jibby Joppa hat gazed back at him. By late afternoon, they had reached the ground, foothills, and the stage pulled up at a relay station for a change of horses. With the mountains rising at their shoulders, Praiseworthy and Jack stood at the well, refreshing themselves with dippers of cool water. The four-horse team was being replaced with a team of six for the hard climb ahead. Do you think he's got Dr. Buckby's map with him? Jack whispered. No doubt about it, said Praiseworthy. I'd wager he doesn't take his hand off that dueling pistol, even when he's asleep. We'll need a shotgun to get the map away from him. A uh, four-shooter, at least. Lacking one and the other, said the butler. We have to rely on our wits, Master Jack. I have no intention of allowing Dr. Buckby to be cheated of his map. Soon they were underway again. The narrow road climbed sharply. Oak trees gave way to shadow darkened pines, and the sun was setting across the valley as if to desert them, and the driver's whip cracked in the air like rifle shots. Inside the wooden coach, the passengers sat knee to knee as before and held on against the bumps and ruts of the road. Finally, the stage rounded a bend and the trail seemed to shoot up like a ladder. Everybody out, shouted the driver. Push, gents, push. Could I, Higgins? Didn't take his hand off the pistol butt for a moment. He pushed with one hand. Slowly, the stagecoach, piled high on top with luggage and supplies, climbed the road. The driver urged the team on with his whip. Keep at it, gents. We're gaining. Jack put his shoulder to the coach like the others and dug his shoes in the dirt. Halfway up the hill, it seemed to him the driver must have had six whips in his hands for all the noise he was making. Suddenly a window shattered and then another, and just as suddenly Jack became aware that it wasn't only the crack of the whip in the air. Gunshots! Road agents! The driver yelled. He set the brake and reached for his rifle. Hold up! Praiseworthy pushed Jack under the coach. Jonas T. Fletcher had beat him there. 
Through the spokes of the big wheels, Jack saw a dozen horsemen, red bandanas around their faces, charging out of the pines. Kadai Higgins drew his dueling pistol and fired. He missed. He didn't have a chance to reload. The road agents had them surrounded, their guns and rifles bristling in the twilight. The leader, a big fellow with holes in his boots, called to the driver, Throw down your rifle! Rest you! Reach for the sky! Or I'll send you there! Pronto! Jack swallowed hard and came out in the open. Praise Reddy gave him a reassuring glance and didn't seem scared at all. They raised their hands. Kadai Higgins growled to himself, but his arms shot up like the other. Sorry to interrupt your journey, said the leader. We'll only detain you a moment. Boys, hop to it. Two of the outlaws climbed down to the top of the stage and threw down the trunks and boxes and carpet bags. Others broke them open to paw through the contents for valuables. Meanwhile, another pair of road agents made quick work of the passengers. They pulled watches and chains off of vests and tugged buckskin pouches of gold dust from pockets and belts. Jack tried not to look up at praiseworthy's white, white gloves. The outlaws would never think of looking there, would they? All right, gents, said one of the gang. All right, oops, sorry. Good. Um, All right, gents, said one of the gang, threw the, uh, threw the bandana across his mouth. Now lower your hands one by one and let's have your rings. He started with the Frenchman and then came to Kadai Higgins. He wore a gold ring set with a ruby like a drop of blood. Stolen, no doubt, thought Jack. The rogue is being outrobed, but it was small comfort. Why, I wore this ring since I was a lad, said Kadai Higgins. It won't come off. <laughs> In that case, the outlaw laughed. We'll just have to chop off the finger. Kadai Higgins removed the ring in an instant, and the highwayman roared. I don't have a ring, said Jack. I can see that boy. The road agent moved on to Praiseworthy. Well, look here. We got a regular gentleman with gloves on. Not a gentleman, corrected Praiseworthy. Merely a butler. What's this? I never did hear of a butler. Jack's heart began to beat faster. Praiseworthy pulled off his right hand glove. Their gold dust, their grub stake, would soon be exposed, but Praiseworthy seemed unconcerned as he could be. How about the other hand, growled the outlaw. Naturally, said Praiseworthy. He pulled a glove off each finger, carefully, but casually, and held up his bare hand. The gold dust remained in the fingers of the glove. No rings, as you can see. And the outlaw moved on. Praiseworthy gave Jack a wink without winking, and very calmly pulled the gloves on again. But another big fellow was emptying Praiseworthy's carpet bag in the dirt. Shirts, cufflinks, hairbrush. Why, look here, a ruffian chuckled. A picture, a regular beauty, ain't she? Jack recognized the tintype at once. It was his Aunt Arabella. He didn't know. Or he didn't know Praiseworthy had her picture along. When he glanced up, Praiseworthy had gone white with anger. I'll thank you to return that picture to my bag, he warned stamping each word out of cold steel. You don't say. Why, I'll be proud to own a picture like this. I guess I'll just take it along. The rest happened so fast that Jack missed half of it in the blink of an eye. Praiseworthy, in his fury, struck like a bolt of lightning. Grabbing the ruffian to his feet by the shirt front, he slammed his left gloved fist into the man's bandana-covered face. The outlaw hurled back as if he'd been struck with a stick of cordwood, and he just lay there. Boy, look at that, said the undertaker in awe. Knocked out that big fella 15 feet uphill. If his fellow outlaws had held their fire, it was only because they were too startled by the butler's awesome left jab. They were like trees glowing from the ground. They stood on, and then their leader seemed to grin behind his bandana. I'd take my hat off to you, he said, but it ain't fitting for a man in my line of work. That was something to see. Boys, lift our fallen friend across the saddle, and we'll be going. Jack gazed at Praiseworthy with fresh admiration. The butler had never let on that he was so handy with his fists. The truth of the matter was, 
that Praiseworthy had been as surprised as the others to see the brood go flying, and then he remembered the heavy gold dust packed in the fingertips of the glove. It was exactly as heavy as lead. With his fingers clutched around it, his fist had had the kick of a mule. He picked up Aunt Arabella's picture and dusted it off. It seemed curious to Jack that he had brought it along. It made him feel strangely closer to praiseworthy than ever before. One more thing, said the gang leader. All of you gents, take off your coats and drop them in a pile. The guns came up again, and that left no room for argument. Jonas T. Fletcher peeled off his frock coat. Kadai Higgins dropped his dusty linen coat. And regretfully, Praiseworthy added his fine black coat to the pile. He would miss her. Never met an immigrant yet, said the leader, who didn't have gold pieces sewed up in the lining of his coat. You won't need coats in this heat, gents, so we'll just take them along. An instant later, the highwaymen spurred their horses and carried away their booty of watches, rings, buckskin, gold pouches, and caps, and coats. Praiseworthy, unaccustomed to mere shirt sleeves, stood in the dust like a leopard suddenly deprived of his spots. Wait till the boys hear about this, said the undertaker. Fifteen feet uphill! Praiseworthy moved past him to step in front of Kadai Higgins. I'll thank you, sir, to hand over Dr. Buckby's map. The dispirited villain reached for his dueling pistol, and Jack stopped in his tracks. Was Praiseworthy trying to get himself killed? Don't bother to draw your gun, said the butler. I was careful to notice that you never reloaded it. The map, sir, the map. The other man stared at him out of his scarred eye and then began to chuckle, but to Jack it sounded as much like a growl as a chuckle. You're late, said Kadai Higgins. Late? The map was sewn up in the lining of 